listening to Coffee and Conversation with Recovery Advocate Network, the nonprofit organization that strives to address the staggering disparity in resource availability for individuals suffering from mental health disorders, processing disorders, addictions, trauma healing, and sexual identity challenges. Together, we strive to end the stigma associated with these challenges so that true healing can begin. Welcome back to Coffee in Conversation with Recovery Advocate Network. I'm your host, Ann, and welcome you to episode number 55. Today's guest is Mary Beth O'Connor, author of the book, From Junkie to Judge, One Woman's Triumph Over Trauma and Addiction. You know, I love to look at all these notes. So what do we talk about? In this episode, Mary Beth shares her journey from childhood trauma and addiction to recovery. She discusses the link between the two and the coping mechanisms that individuals develop based on that trauma and the challenges of setting healthy boundaries. Mary Beth also highlights the importance of understanding the impact the trauma has on the body and the role of various forms of self-harm as a coping mechanism, including drugs, alcohol, sex, and physical self-harm. She emphasizes that recovery is possible for everyone, everyone, and that there are multiple paths to recovery. Mary Beth, her story sheds light on the complexities of relationships with parents who've caused the trauma. She also addresses the challenges of accessing affordable treatment for substance use disorder, which we are very familiar about here at RAM. She talks about the challenges of accessing treatment, the limitations of some traditional programs, and the importance of personalized paths to recovery. She emphasizes the importance of peer support and long-term healing process. Mary Beth encourages individuals to repair themselves and seek assistance, reminding us that it is never too late to find a way, a path forward, and to overcome that horrible stigma. More about Mary Beth. So, for Mary Beth, childhood trauma and other traumas and abuse led to substance use disorder or addiction. Beginning with alcohol at age 12, she spent several years abusing various drugs till she finally found methamphetamine at 16 and started shooting up at 17. She struggled with meth until she was 32 years old. By incorporating ideas from multiple sources to build a secular, which is a non-12 step or faith-based approach, to build a secular recovery plan that worked for her, Mary Beth has been sober since 1994. She used similar techniques to address the trauma and related anxiety as well. Mary Beth is a board member of Life Ring Secular Recovery and She Recovers Foundation. She speaks on behalf of these organizations about those multiple paths to recovery and all topics related to substance use disorder and recovery. She also speaks about sexual abuse and rape, child abuse, domestic violence, PTSD, anxiety, and recovering from these. Mary Beth's award-winning memoir, From Junkie to Judge, One Woman's Triumph Over Trauma and Addiction, is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, other sites, as well as your local bookstore. She's also placed essays in publications such as The Wall Street Journal, The Los Angeles Times, and Recovery Today. Professionally, six years into recovery, Mary Beth attended Berkeley Law. She worked at a large firm in Silicon Valley and then litigated class actions for the federal government. In 2014, she was appointed a federal administrative law judge, a position from which she retired in 2020. She currently lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with her beloved doc, whom she will celebrate 40 years with in April of this year. Enough of this. Are you excited? I know I am. So let's do it. But first, a reminder about our three C's of engagement. Number one, click. Click that subscribe button. Hit the notifications. Go ahead and give us a five-star review and and a love and a heart or whatever it is on the platform that you're using. You are going to love this episode. So do it now so you don't forget. The second C, commit. 
commit to staying for the full episode. It is amazing everything that Mary Beth shares. Her journey is so inspiring. It's a reminder that anyone, everyone can recover. So don't give up and stick to the end. And then our third C, what is it? Oh, come on, of course, it's your coffee. So fill up your coffee, sit back, relax, and let's get started. Okay, good afternoon. It's a Sunday afternoon here. I'm currently in Los Altos, California, and this is actually the very last episode I will record at this location. I'm in the process of moving cross country to Atlanta, Georgia, and I thought about postponing this interview, and then I read the book, and I said, absolutely not. I cannot postpone it. I have to do it today. So listeners, this is your host, Ange, and I have with me Mary Beth O'Connor, the author of the book, Junkie to Judge, which everyone knows I read every single book if the author is going to be on the podcast, and I do lots of notes, and this book was amazing. I, Mary Beth, I would say I read it in one sitting. I almost read it in one sitting. I had to spend maybe an hour or something the following day, but I had a lot of amazing moments, a lot of similarities in our stories, a few tears, and a lot of just excitement and joy in many parts of it. So I'll lead with that. And now I'm going to shut up. And I love for you to fully introduce yourself and tell the audience about who Mary Beth is and why you're here today. So yeah, so the full title of the book is From Junkie to Judge, One Woman's Triumph Over Trauma and Addiction. And because that's what it is for me, it was both, right? So I grew up in a household where like my mother wasn't really bonded to me and I was left for the first six months of my life in a nunnery and for three years with a great grandmother. And um, and my mother, you know, was violent at times, but things got much, much worse um, when I was nine and she married my stepfather. And he was very violent with her, physically, sexually violent with me. It was just that household where you never knew what was going to happen and where what you did and um, and the consequence, they were not very closely tied together, which creates a lot of extra stress. Uh, I, I, one example I can use to just sort of um, embedded is that I taught my sister when I was around 10, then she was eight, that when we emptied the dishwasher, you know, put the dishes away uh, as a chore, that we needed to do it one dish at a time so it didn't clack. Like that was the level of stress and strain. Um, and so for me, uh, you know, my solution to that was when I found drugs. And my first drug was when I was 12 and it was alcohol and it was Boone's Farm, Strawberry Hill wine, <laughs> which a lot of people know. <laughs> Yes, so, I can relate. <laughs> I mean, we drank it out of like um, gr um, glasses that used to have grape jelly on them that had Flintstones characters on the outside. You know, like that was sort of the level of our sophistication, right? We're drinking out of Flintstones grape jelly glasses. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but, but it captured my attention because what I noticed was I felt better, right? Like I felt sort of like, like a weight was lifted off my shoulder, like I could take a deep breath. And that I noticed, you know, this is a really positive experience and I really need to have more of this. And so I just pursued it right away. And, you know, when I moved on, I added in pot and pills and acid. And then when I was 16, I found my drug of choice, which was methamphetamine. And I was shooting up within six months. I mean, I was a full bore addiction when I graduated from high school. So that was the sort of the first, you know, 17 years trajectory. <laughs> and at the same time, one of the things that I related to, and I was telling Mary Beth before we pressed record, that while her book was so powerful, her, her childhood is... Um, very similar in many ways to what mine is. And many of the listeners know this because I've shared much of my trauma and challenges. And whereas I, I didn't choose drugs, I've said to a lot of individuals actually, and I think one of the reasons I'm so passionate about getting to know humans as humans is because I had this moment, I was 15 and my high school was the largest high school in the state of Georgia. We had the highest pregnancy rate and like drugs were everywhere. And I remember walking into the bath, the girls' bathroom and seeing some girls shooting up. And I remember thinking in my head, the only blessing I had was that I thought I knew my personality 
and I go over the top for everything. And I, and I know you do too, because I've read your book. And I thought if I do that, I know I'll just end up being a prostitute on the seat, on the side of the street and probably dead. And I say that to say that I love getting to know humans who walked all those areas of life because I feel like they're just like me. And I just had this one moment where I chose, you know, promiscuity and a lot of other things instead. But had I chosen to do that, I know exactly what I would have fallen the same path. So yeah, I could totally relate in that instance. Well, and I'm glad you, you know, as you know, one of my chapters is called promiscuity because, you know, for me, that was, well, that was part of that. I didn't even know that I was allowed to put sort of boundaries around my body and what happened to it. But also it was a way of getting attention and it was a positive attention from a lot of not just boys, but men. I mean, you know, men that were over 18 when I was 13, 14, 15. Um, but, but I also feel like a lot of us are so shamed about it that we don't talk openly. And so I, I'm glad to hear you talk about it, but it's why I included that acknowledgement in the chapter, um, you know, in the book, because I feel like, you know, it's sort of in, in my druggy world, it's just part of what you're sort of, um, what you had to trade for drugs. Right. And that's just part of that world. And the guys would have traded it more if they could have, you know, but every, you know, everyone was doing what they could to get what they wanted. And it's not as if it, well, I did have, um, I did take money a couple of times, but mostly it was people I knew, right? They're like drug buddies, people that you're spending days with getting high. It's not, it's people in town. It's, you know, friend of a friend. Um, but at the same time, the numbers added up partly because I didn't, I didn't, feel that I was sort of worthy of um, protecting myself in any way. I just, I just viewed it as, well, it's, it's not important. It doesn't really matter anyway, and I can get something out of it. Absolutely. And I, you know, we've had episode 13 on this podcast. We talked about the link between childhood trauma and addiction. That, that whole episode was dedicated to it. We've talked about those facts in many different episodes. And I believe it was maybe episode eight or something. We talked about boundaries, which like, Townsend and Cloud's, Cloud and Townsend's book, Boundaries, is one of my favorite books. No is a Complete Sentence is one of my favorite books. And I love one of the parts, I was looking back at my notes that you talked about that really stood out to me when you were just saying about you know not knowing exactly that you could say no and there was this part where you said, um, I'm going to find it. Da, 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 da. I love, sometimes I've got the notes memorized ahead of time and sometimes I don't. <laughs> it's at the moment. But it was a moment where you talked about not being able, not even understanding that you could say no. And I think it was one of the things, okay. One is that not understanding that you could say no, and also understanding that your adverse childhood experiences, so this is on page 186, and you talked about your childhood experiences primed you for future assaults because while hypervigilant in some ways, you were numb and couldn't recognize the danger in other ways. Yeah. So this idea of like not realizing it's danger, but needing to find that coping mechanism and so using the skills that you had that were you were taught to find that coping mechanism to get that psychological and emotional relief temporarily and not realizing that then you'd be prone to danger in those areas. Right. I mean, on one hand, I was very jumpy, like I was hyper vigilant as far as noises coming out, you know, at me or somebody moving fast out of the corner of my eye, you know, I would flip around. And so it had sort of those PTSD hyper vigilance traits. But at the same time, I walked into situations where I ended up getting assaulted. And in retrospect, there were some warning signs that I just completely missed. And then later, I moved in with a violent boyfriend, which is also a very common path to people who have um, suffered with child abuse or sexual abuse or sexual assault. And so all of those things, it's, I, and, and then I felt, I felt like I was just, you know, inexplicably sort of crazy was the term I would have used in those days by making these choices. I didn't understand the connection. And so I just thought there's just something wrong with me. You know, I, I chose him, right? I moved in with him or I walked in there or I got in the car. Um, and I didn't understand that connection until I was older, which meant that I was a lot of self blame and, and self judgment about it. 
So I, another part is that I love the book, The Body Keeps the Score. Yes. And the reason I, and I read that book in, when I was in treatment. So I was uh, like you, you were a victim of kidnapping several times. I was also the victim of a kidnapping hostage situation and I was held hostage for five days and I was being prepared to be sold into the sex trade. And this was in 2020 in the time of kidnap or in time of COVID. And so I had not read the book, The Body Keeps a Score. And I'd had people tell me before, you should read this book, okay? And I was just like, whatever. I'm like, yeah, I, I, got, I got my shit together. Leave me alone. That, that was my, you know, I was COO of a company. I went to Georgia Tech, very, very intelligent, gifted and intelligent, such as yourself. And I don't need to read this book. I want to forget my childhood. I don't want to think about my childhood. Have you lost your mind? And so I remember that then after I had, I escaped from this kidnapping and then spent six months in, in treatment. And in one of the treatment centers, I read the book. And much like how I have your book tabbed, I, I highlighted almost the whole book because Mary Beth, I had this moment where I, just like you, I thought, why is it I can be this is going to sound familiar to you. Why is it I can be so successful? I can be top of my class at Georgia Tech. I can be a successful, run a, build a company, run a company. But what I can't do is I can't stay married. Um, I can't have those intimate relationships. Why is it that I have you know these repeated stories of uh, sexual abuse as a child, then as a teen, and then this kidnapping? It, you know, it. You know the adage: if it keeps happening to you, it must be you. I believed that falsehood. And I also, the, the, and 187, when you described how you reacted in the kidnapping, when the guys picked you up and kidnapped you, I, I just like paused for a moment when I read that, because there were times in my kidnapping and when I've tried to share the story with people and they don't get how it happened. And I also couldn't describe to them why I froze in the moment, why I, allowed him to walk next to me why i did these things and so i'll read that that section you said you know at home you become attuned to the adult's emotions and intentions analyze degrees of risk and formulated appropriate responses that's what uh, victims of childhood abuse do mm -hmm. we we analyze were they happy or on the verge of exploding very important information to know what were the odds that their rage would be directed at me which was pretty high right could I tamp down the threat or should I brace myself for an avoidable onslaught? So in the van, so Mary Beth, I'll let you describe the, the kidnapping, but in the van, also you'd understood you couldn't control the situation. So I felt the same way in my kidnapping, the five days I was kidnapped. Instead, you focused on reducing the risk. Yes. Although you did what your rapist wanted, you weren't passive. You listened, you watched, you evaluated the kidnappers to discern their objectives and personalities, and you chose the reaction that lessened their concerns and increased their positive feelings towards you. And that was on page 187. And I had very similar reactions. In the five days, I actually cycled between being very compliant, like how can I figure out how to be compliant and reduce the pain, to I'm not compliant at all, screw you, I'll just say this, fuck you. Um, get away from me. You know, I just, these ro roller coasters, right? But reading that, it was so powerful to me because I said, aha, that's it. I was trained to be a victim, but also smart enough to try and figure out how to survive. Exactly. I mean, I, you know, and I, and I really struggled with a lot of aspects of that kidnapping and rape for years afterward that the book helped me believe. I mean, I had processed it and healed to a degree, but the book helped me to another degree because I was still second guessing myself to a certain extent. Um, in particular, the decision at the gas station where I, you know, could I have gotten away at that point or was I right to not try? I was second guessing myself about that for, for decades, you know, but when I wrote the book, it just became clearer to me that first of all, Mary Beth in that moment understood all the nuances and all the factors better than I will ever understand it later. But realistically, there was no way out, you know, there was no way out. Um, but it is that it is, I mean, in some ways, my odds of surviving that were higher because I was an abused child. You know, I mean, that's the, that's the truth of it, but that's not um, an experience that you want the preparations for. I mean, <laughs> 
<laughs> um, but it turned out that I did understand it was just instinctual because I had been in that situation so many times in different ways that right away I was able to, the biggest thing was I was able to stay calm. It drives me crazy on like TV shows and movies where like there's nobody around for miles and the woman is screaming her head off. It's like, why are you doing that? Like, you, right. you know, like you're, nobody's going to hear you and you're just going to piss them off. You, you know, it's not that I don't understand the emotion. It's that you're increasing your risk by not, you know, calming yourself and dealing with it. And it's interesting that you say you went up and down, but you, you had more days. I mean, you had a longer time to have to cycle through the emotions. Mine was six hours, which was long, but, you know, days is a lot longer. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that my being that specific about it, you know, helped help you feel like, you know, here's somebody else who's been through it, who understands that emotional roller coaster. Uh, I mean, part of the goal of the book is always to be of use, right? To help people understand or, or if, um, understand others if it's not their experience, but to help people with that experience um, process things a little better or know that there are, um, that what happened to them and how they felt about it is understandable and that other people like me have had that same experience. Yeah, no, it was, it was very powerful. And I, I absolutely agree. I mean, the, the purpose of this podcast is to provide voices to individuals, both healing for the, oftentimes the individuals who are being interviewed, but individuals across the world listen to this podcast in a lot of different countries. And, and whenever I see more countries added, I get so much joy because I realize there's someone there that needs to hear this voice of recovery or this, you know, people that have had really hard, difficult times and have figured out a way towards living and thriving and that there, there is hope for everyone, regardless of, of how far down the path we may or may not have, have gone. Um, I love that. And I mean, you said in the very end of the book, in recovery, about recovery, you're like, recovery is hard for a while, but active substance use disorder is hard forever. Yes. Recovery takes focused practice, but that's often for just the first few years or intimately thereafter. Addiction is hard every day, every single freaking day, because the beautiful highs of the beginning are long gone and the destruction is ever increasing. In addition, whatever challenges the world throws your way could be worse if you're in active addiction. So choose the easier way, choose recovery. And so that's listeners, that's on page 312. And I, I loved that part because I was like, yes, addiction is hard every single day. I'm in the process right now. I still struggle with drinking alcohol. And I, I one of the parts of the book, you talked about stopping one addiction and then entering into self-harm. And I was thinking this the other day is that I was, you know, eight days without alcohol. Now I'm 10 days without alcohol. It's always a struggle for me. And I was eight days without alcohol and I was feeling all this anxiety. And I was like, okay, that coping mechanism is gone. And a coping mechanism I've struggled with for ever since early childhood is self-harm. And listeners, if you don't understand why, why people would uh, resort to self-harm, it's another form of relief. It's another form of feeling alive in a different way. It's, um, you can probably describe it much better than I can, but it, it occurred to me, oh, I should use this mechanism. And then I was like, no, 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 I haven't used that mechanism in over a year and a half. Like, I'm not going to do that. But my brain is still thinking, is still cataloging through the coping mechanisms that are those habits, right? See, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, for, yeah, the self-harm, it's also, it's an endorphin rush, right? I mean, your, your, yes. your dopamine goes up. There's a physiological, positive, chemical impact of self-harm. Um, and for me, I used to do it. I mean, I, I talked about in the book how I would buy glass bottles of beer on purpose over cans because then when I got drunk, I would break the glass and use it to cut, right? And so it was intentional even before I started drinking that day. And, but it was a, a form of relief. But to me, it also felt like it was almost visible proof of my pain. Like, this is how bad my pain is. Look at the slices on my arm. You know, it was it was sort of a uh, an external way to, to show the pain, even though I tried to hide the marks once they right. happened. That, there was that aspect to it. Um, I remember one time when I was working because I was doing this in college and I had a part time job when I was in college and my supervisor had my, my sleeve slid up or something and I had bandages on and my supervisor noticed and asked me and I made some, 
you know, excuse. But at the same time, a part of me felt warmed that she had noticed, you know, and, and asked and showed a bit of caring. Like there was a, um, I felt seen. I felt, even though I pushed her off and denied it, I, I still felt seen. And so it is, self-harm is, is a complicated uh, re reaction or behavior that, um, that is not uncommon after child abuse, not uncommon to coexist with PTSD or anxiety or a lot of other conditions. Absolutely. And I had no idea that that was, I mean, I, I think what this says is that oftentimes the coping mechanisms that we use, what I learned in reading The Body Keeps the Score and what I've learned in my years of recovery and the amazing guests that have been on this podcast is that so many of the coping mechanisms that I chose are pretty universal to individuals who have grown up severely abused, brutalized, you know, sexually abused, emotional neglect, physical, all of that, that these are common things. And listeners, I will share that they, I, I think there has been this stereotype that only individuals from certain, uh, certain families, like, um, let's just say certain families that don't have high educational backgrounds or high IQs that don't know better or something like that. Like there's this idea of that versus really the reality is you have some very successful, very intelligent people who grow up and choose these, not choose, but utilize these coping mechanisms. And so there's really, if anything, if you get anything from this episode, just understanding that there's really no shame in it because you have two amazing women who are both growing through it to attest to this. And you could reach out to either one of us and we would help you attest to it. Okay. So you, you know, in your book, you start and you tell about your childhood and I can completely relate to the lack of attachment with your mother. I had the exact same uh, lack of attachment. I, I was instead sent off with my aunt and uncle for a period of time. My mother loved my brother's. They were the world's best thing ever, and I was the world's worst. And so I had that kind of dichotomy. I didn't have any advocates in my family. It was just me against the world. And so, but, you know, growing up and then you in your instance, you get accepted into college and you move away to college. Can you talk about that experience? Because I think for me, it was, I could not wait to leave my hometown. I could not wait to leave my house. And I've like, never taken anything from my parents after my first year of college. I've done everything myself and very proud of that. But can you talk about your experience there? Yeah, so I grew up in central Jersey and, and I'm actually a, a very blue collar girl. I mean, my stepfather was a steel worker and my mother was a secretary. So people in my family normally didn't go to college. So it was a big deal. Um, but I, I went to California. I mean, I really wanted to get away, right? I went all the way. <laughs> You're like, how far can I get? <laughs> can I go? Um, and, and, and there was a part of me that really, well, I was conflicted. So when I was leaving, I actually, I didn't pack until the morning of, because I was still, I was really heavily into meth and I was afraid to leave. And I didn't know, I thought I was going to fail out of college because I was so, you know, addicted to the meth, but I couldn't think of a good excuse not to go. Like that was really what it came down to. So I left. Um, but a part of me also hoped it was like a fresh start, you know, like I right. was going to leave my family, leave all those um, abusive circumstances and have a fresh start. And, and for a while I did do better. Like I reduced my drug use, you know, I, I, a lot, I, I, I mean, I still overuse, but I didn't use on a daily basis. I mostly used alcohol, um, sometimes cocaine, which was new to me, sometimes pills, some hallucinogens, mostly on the weekend though. Sometimes it would roll into the week. So I, I did better and I was working half time and going to Berkeley. I mean, you know, it was a challenging schedule. But I had that kidnapping and, you know, three men, six hours. Um, I, I was into self-harm and then I moved in with a violent boyfriend. And it was like, I sort of just lost the little grip that I had. And I started using meth again in January of my senior year. And I didn't sober until I was 32. And things just got worse from there down. So I had a couple of years that were better. Um, but I just, I didn't have the emotional, um, ability, the skills to know how to deal with my pain. I even tried to go to therapy once in a while in college, but I didn't have money. So it was like students, you know, and they're just, yeah. 
very good skills there. And so I didn't make any real healing progress and things, bad things kept happening. So, um, so I, I, I started using meth again in January of my senior year and I, I went another 10 years. And you have had, and I, your, your mother has since passed and you talk about it in the book and I've, that really stuck out to me. You know, my, my father has been dying of cancer for gosh, now, as long as I can remember, I just heard yesterday, my stepmom apparently has congestive heart failure and my emotion. And so many people have said something similar to me as they did to you about how you would feel in that. And I've come to this place in my life. When I walked away from my family, it was the best thing I ever did. The absolute best thing I ever did. And I have had, I've come to this point where I can say, I, I wish them the best and, and that's it. Like it's, it's not a part of me. It's not involved with me anymore. I've moved on and I feel comfortable with that. But I, I wonder, because everyone's like, oh, if, you know, when they pass away, you don't go to the funeral, you'll just be devastated for the rest of your, and I'm like, I really, I really don't think I, I will be. And, um, and so I was interested in hearing about that. So how do you feel and share as much as you do or do not want. How do you feel, you know, coming? Because I know a lot of listeners will have these mixed feelings about their parents if they came from childhood abuse, because we're just innately supposed to love our parents. And you can have a point of love and not like, I don't know, you could have a lot of those feelings. And yet there's this other part of the childhood you never had that you could have had. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, my stepfather, of course, you know, my mother actually divorced him a year after I left for college and I would never had no contact with him afterward. Um, but my mother uh, there, I did have a relationship with her until she died to a degree. And so part of the problem with my mother wasn't what she did in my childhood. It was that she kept doing it, <laughs> you know, like she never, she never changed. And so when I got sober, for example, um, she, she, there were a lot of pressures on me to, you know, help her financially. Well, the problem with that was that she had a gambling problem and a shopping problem. And I had a, re I mean, I was 32. I had a, I had a horrible resume. I started out with like a part-time low-level admin job. I, I had to, you know, recuperate financially. I had debt and, you know, and no savings. And so I it wasn't like I was flush with money, but also she was wasting her money and yet she wants me to, sh you know, shovel over a whole bunch of money to her. But also emotionally, she put a lot of, you know, demand. She won't, and she doesn't really have anything to offer. Um, on the other hand, she did end up with custody of my sister's kids, my two nieces and nephew. And so I wanted access to them. And so I had to maintain a civil relationship with her. But it took a while because when I first got sober, her behavior, her yelling, her, you know, aggressiveness, it triggered me to behave that way. Cause you know, that's what I knew from her. And then gradually I realized like, I don't want, I don't want to behave that way. And so it was a process to learn to emotionally disengage so that when she um, acted in that way, I was able to stay calm. I wasn't going to, you know, get sucked, um, sink in with her and, and go into that crazy place. Um, the last time she hit me, uh, I was like, we were dry. I was driving down the road at like 50 miles an hour and she's beating me on the head. The oh, I was just horrified. <laughs> I was reading that and here I'm just like, oh my gosh, they're going to drive off a cliff or something like, but, but you know what I thought too? I thought, okay. And I've through a lot of healing, I think be, becoming a mother was one of the best things that ever happened to me. It, I don't think that I know becoming a mother. My daughter is amazing. So I have a, a, a special needs daughter. She's 21. And when I became a mother, I loved my daughter so much that it suddenly occurred to me, okay, the things that my parents did to me, they have so many mental health problems because it's not natural for a parent because I could never dream of doing that. And when I was reading that part, when you guys were on the interstate and you're going 50 miles an hour and you, you tell her no, and she you know, does what she does. I just thought, okay, this is proof of the mental insanity of individuals who have that. And there, there's a part of like me that also has a little bit of just like pain and sorrow for her and for my mother and for my father, that this is what the demons they have inside of them, that they don't move past, right? 
because like that's just against human like you're not going to try and get in an accident going 50 miles an hour it's really not the way you want to die like if you have a suicidal thing you're gonna like jump i don't know there are a lot of other ways listeners i'm not going to give you ideas but but driving down the interstate at 50 miles an hour is not the way you want to go yeah i mean it was really like you say it was calm you know relationship with her to the best of my ability until she died but as you said, people were telling me that when she went, when she died, I was going to have some kind of a, you know, strong emotional reaction. Um, and when she, she was in hospice the last week and I went to Arizona where she lived and I helped my brother, you know, who lived there with her and made sure she got what she needed. And I spent time with her and, you know, made sure that she was being properly cared for by the hospice staff. Um, but like that was my sort of duty, you know, as her daughter to make sure she was comfortable. But when she died, I felt bad for her because she was only 72. You know, she died relatively young. She really hadn't had a happy life, but I didn't feel pain for me. Like I had really emotionally separated from her already. And so it wasn't like I really lost anything. Um, I mean, so I did my best to acknowledge the relationship and do what I felt I should do, what was my responsibility. Um, but I didn't have, um, there wasn't grief because I had already separated. I had already grieved the loss of something that I never had. The fact that I never had it more than a loss. Oh, that's beautiful. That is so powerful. The loss of something you never had. And and yeah, I, c I can relate to that. That is really impactful. Okay, so you, you, you go off to college and you graduate from college and then you decide to go to law school and, and you have this horrific, which I think is also so common, right? People who are abused often, somehow we manage to find partners who have those same traits and then we of course get blamed for it, right? Well, you're choosing the wrong person over and over. Okay, there's a lot of reason that circuitry is built that way and so many people do it. And so you, you had that instance and then you, you met doc and slowly over time, one of the, the, the things that I love, cause I want to talk about your recovery and I want to talk about, we are both passionate about the fact that there are many different paths towards recovery and we could get on our soapbox about the fact that there is not just one. So if anyone ever tells you which I know people will tell you, I've heard it, that there is only this one path and you have to do this and yada, 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 or you will never get, you will never recovery. Do not listen to them. But the thing that I, I love is I was, I was in this torn part because I'm like, okay, Mary Beth, he loves you. He's great for you. Don't screw it up, Mary Beth, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then you go back to drugs. I'm like, ah, oh, she screwed it up again. You know, this is the, the turmoil as I'm reading this, right? And then you had this part. So I'm going to read it directly out of the book. So it's on page 235. Let me find page 235, as well as my reading glasses that I, I don't see. So maybe I'll read it without that. Okay. So, well, first, I'm going to read this, this bottom paragraph because I, I love it. The whole thing is great because it, I want to talk about recovery. So you say, thus, to summarize, substance use disorder is not fun. It is a horrible, demoralizing, life-threatening, and life-altering experience. We both agree. I was ruining my life and destroying my body. Sometimes I could not see this. Other times I did not care. But mostly I did not know how to crawl out of this deep, dark hole. That is so powerful. I, I mean, I can completely relate to it because I would sit and think, I am so smart. How could I not figure out... I can get out of any situation. I mean, I can get out of kidnapping. I can, you know, people say if, if on a desert island, I want to be with Ange because she can get out of any situation. Thanks to childhood abuse. Uh, <laughs> so then you said, I'd continued on this self-destructive downward path for two decades. I'd ruined the academic and career opportunities I'd worked for and wanted and maybe d uh, demolished my relationship with Doc. For the last few years, I knew I was a junkie but did not believe I could live any other way and did not have the energy to pursue recovery. At least I didn't until I did. I love it. I get chills reading that until you did. Okay. So tell us about that, that journey. Like the day you said, I am going to recovery that I did moment. 
Well, I mean, I'll say first of all that it was a process, right? Which is what it mostly is. I mean, there's the moment I went to rehab and then there's the moment what, which was more gradual of actually believing that recovery was on the table for me and I might actually be able to achieve it. And those were at two very different points in time. Um, but by 32, I really had, you know, I, I said I'd work my way down the corporate ladder. You know, I, I couldn't hold a job because I, I love that. And also I was really starting have physical problems like you know that toxicity of the meth was showing up in my body um and i was just debilitated like emotionally debilitated energetically debilitated feeling hopeless and then doc was finally ready to throw me out and so it was everything in combination that made me say you know at 32 you know what if i go to rehab you know and so <laughs> that that was the impetus to do it um, but it wasn't, it wasn't even that I thought I could get sober at first. I really, I, I, I really wanted to go to try to figure out how to use less. Like, it's not that I wanted to keep using. It's just that less was as far as my imagination could go, because I knew if I use less, my life would be less chaotic. And so that was sort of like the goal. It wasn't that I was running off sobriety. It's that I didn't really believe it was on the table for me. And that took a while for me to really um, appreciate and to be able to believe it enough to do the hard work that it takes in early sobriety. I, th I think just restating what you said, you didn't think that recovery and full sobriety was on the table for you. And I think it's, it's, it's such a powerful gift that you and I both know it's on the table for everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, and yet can totally relate to the fact of thinking, oh, I can see how this person can recover and this person can recover, but I absolutely cannot recover. It's not on the, on the table for me, which is powerful. Okay. So then I'm trying to remember what you did. Oh, uh, remind me how you managed to get into treatment. Well, I'll say this. It, this was 93 because, by the way, I just had 30 years of sobriety. And Yay! Um, but, um, but even today, it's true that it, we, we talk, when we talk about people being in their substance use disorder, we judge them or they are judged by many as if there is readily accessible, affordable treatment for everyone in America. And it is not true. Okay, it's not no. true. And it wasn't true for me because I didn't have insurance and I didn't have any money. And so I had to, you know, call a lot of places to try to find who would take me. And then I was on a wait list and I was on that wait list. And I had to call every Monday between nine and noon to keep my name moving up the list. If I missed one Monday, I would drop to the bottom again. And I had a stable house, you know, I was living in a stable environment and um, still it was a challenge and I was very proud that I managed to do it. And I never found yes. the bottom, but 10 weeks, I had to call for 10 weeks to be, until my name was at the top when I got into rehab. Which, which is so powerful. And, and I don't know uh, if you know this, Mary Beth, but uh, a big part of Recovery Advocate Network, we were started by individuals, uh, we were, all in treatment at a place in Florida for a variety of reasons. I was there. I was actually there at that point for at what I call eating disorder camp. It was part of my six months worth of recovery because if I couldn't drink and I couldn't do self-harm, then I just wasn't going to eat. I learned at a very young age, my mother used to feed my brothers and not feed me. So I learned, well, if I'm not hungry, you're not hurting me, right? So that was another coping mechanism. So I happened to be in eating disorder camp. And I met these other individuals who were there for trauma, alcohol, grief, all these different reasons, depression. And we're sitting at a table drinking coffee in the morning. And we said, where is you know, Susie? And someone said, oh, her insurance dropped her yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so listeners, if you don't know this, I mean, a lot of times if you're able to get into an alcohol treatment program and if your insurance pays for it, then it's typically a set length of yeah. time for a program. However, if you go into a treatment center for depression or some of these other areas, it's not. It is basically your case is reviewed every 10 days and then your insurance decides whether or not you can continue treatment. And so it is so stressful because you're sitting there thinking, am I gonna get dropped today? And as someone else, when you see somebody else get dropped and suddenly shipped home with no aftercare and all of these other issues, set them up for disaster, then you think, oh, it's happening to them. It can happen 
to me next. And so the group of us said, this is just not acceptable. We don't know how big of an impact we can make on the world to, by providing scholarships and grants for individuals who don't have insurance or get dropped or things like that. But even if we help a few people, which you can relate to in your recovery programs that you're working on, if we can help a few people, then it's worth it. So recovery for anyone who does not know, you can't, if you think to someone, why don't they just go to rehab? Well, because it is really expensive and it is really hard and not all rehabs are created equal. Right. Well, and the other thing is that the, usually it's not a length of time. Even if it's a set length of time, it's 28 or 30 days if you're lucky enough to have insurance. Yes. And that's not the optimal length of time for treatment, right? Um, and so, like, I went into a longer term care program, it was a 90 day minimum. And many people could benefit from longer inpatient. On Absolutely. Hand, not, everybody, not everybody needs inpatient. There needs to be an individual assessment about, you know, what will work and what they have access to. But yeah, it's, it's cookie cutter. Too many people are left out. And so, and that's another reason why the multiple pathways, the different peer support options are particularly important, not just for people when they get out of treatment, but for many people, that is all the treatment. And I put it in quotes because peer support is not treatment. It's, it's a help and they all have um, different programs, different philosophies, different ways of looking at um, techniques and strategies for recovery, but they're not really treatment. They're a help. Um, but Part of the reason it's important that people are informed and educated about their options on peer support is because for a lot of people, that's all they're ever going to be able to access because they don't have any insurance or the ability to pay. Yeah, absolutely true. And the episode that will follow this, I interviewed Jeff Breedlove, who is on the Georgia Council for Recovery, and we're going to put that in a two-part series. And we talk a lot about peer support and the value of peer support, both for the individual who's providing the peer support and for the individuals who are receiving it. Okay. So you 10 weeks, I, I mean, I, my mind is just blowing because I don't know that I could do everything. I, I'm, I just don't know that I could do that make that commitment to every Monday morning within this period of time for 10 weeks to call for that. So you did that. You also had to be 72 hours. Well, you had to be 72 hours sober. I was not. <laughs> I know. For, if you're listening to this on like Spotify or Apple, I did air quotes. Everyone on YouTube, you saw me do the air quotes. <laughs> it's I, know that she, I know that she was not 72 hours, but you were supposed to be 72 hours sober to get into the treatment center as well. Wow. You really right. wanted recovery. Yeah. Well, I mean, and 72 hours sober is, you know, sort of a, we, we so often put obstacles in people's way that are unnecessary and not well-founded, right? But no, but I was 24 hours sober and I was proud of that. You know? so that was well, yeah, I, mean, I think 72 hours is a long period of time. I mean, the first 72 hours of not imbibing on an addictive substance is huge. I mean, I just, when I read that, I just thought, well, I would hope that this treatment center has a huge success rate because they make it so hard for people to get in. <laughs> they really have, which I guess, you know, one of the blessings is I did see people in treatment and recovery who were not taking it seriously. And I, I mean, you, despite the fact that you wanted to use drugs less because you didn't think recovery was for you, I think a lot of people go into treatment because they want to drink less. They want to use drugs. I think that's, that is very common. The idea of giving something up forever is just seems insane, but yeah, you really wanted it. Okay. So you go into the treatment center and now tell us about your experience. So, you know, in my mind, I was going in for medical treatment, right? I have a medical condition. Even in 93, I understood that, you know, <laughs> that it was a yes. brain disorder. Um, and so I think I'm going in for medical treatment. And when I got there the first day, I found out that it was a 12-step exclusive house. And I mean vehemently, exclusively 12-step. And of course, 12 steps is alcohol, it's anonymous, and narcotics, and and all of the anonymouses. Um, and, and that's not a pro I mean... 12 steps is a path that works for some, but it definitely doesn't work for everyone. And it was a terrible fit for me. And I told them that right away. I told them, I don't believe in a higher power. I don't believe in turning my will of my life over. I didn't agree I was powerless. I didn't like to focus on defects. And every time I would raise a concern, they would um, really um, adamantly tell me, this is the only option. You do everything we're telling you or you are going to fail. 
Um, and there was, and if I, they would tell me that I was self will run amok and that my best thinking had gotten me there to which I would always respond, you know, I promise it wasn't my best thinking. <laughs> um, and so it was, it was a surprise, but I also, at first I believed them because they're the experts that I'm paying. And so I really had to decide, well, what the heck am I going to do when they're offering me something that I know I can't do? And so what I decided I was going to do was just really try to keep my ears and my mind open and look for the parts I could use and ignore everything else, you know? So, so I read all the AA big book and I read all of the NA texts and I actively participated in rehab and I listened at meetings for, you know, for things that I thought would be helpful. Like that step one of 12 steps is that you're powerless over your addiction. And I, I didn't agree with that, but I thought about it and I thought, well, what I can agree is that I am powerless to moderate. <laughs> and so I tried, I to like reframe things, but I was still really afraid because of the sort of the universal opinion that I was going to fail. And so when I got home and I'm going to emphasize it's 1994 and there is no Google. Okay. So I got home and I thought, is it really true that there's no other options? And so I got my car and I drove to the library <laughs> and it turned out even in 94, it wasn't true. It just, it wasn't true. And so I found um, Women for Sobriety, which still exists today. And I'm actually, I speak at their conferences now. And I found Rational Recovery, which exists a little bit mostly today as Smart Recovery. And I found SOS, Secular Organization for Sobriety, which exists very little today, but basically is LifeRing Secular Recovery. And I'm on the board for LifeRing. Um, and so it was, first of all, a relief, like, phew, okay. <laughs> Other people have done it other ways. That was... That was a real, um, a real sense of relief for me that I wasn't the only one and that others had succeeded. Um, but I also ended up not following any of the other programs either. I did the same thing I did with 12 Steps. I got the books and I went to meetings and I was just filtering everything for what parts do I think I can use. Um, and today, LifeRing would call that a personal recovery plan, or we might call that a patchwork or a hybrid plan because I mix different options. And so that's that's how I built it. That's how I built my my sober recovery. And it turned out that it actually was helpful to me in the long run because taking control and doing the analysis, like sort of like, well, who am I really? Or what, what do I think might work? It made me sort of... Um, analyze, synthesize, then I would set goals and build a plan and implement the plan. And, and it turned out that all those skills applied to everything. You know, so I was really building up my competency and my confidence to handle life. So it turned out that it helped me, but it really was an unnecessary um, fear period that shouldn't have happened because if you're an expert in the field of substance use disorder and recovery, you really ought to know that there are more that there's more than one way to succeed at, um, at sobriety. Absolutely. And I, I will say that there's more than one way to succeed at any challenge that you have in life. So any challenge that you have, if someone says this is the only path towards success, I really, I would love if you just laugh at them and say, okay, that's not true. And watch me show you it's not true. And I also love how you say, like, I think it's so brilliant in life to look at situations and take the best of it, right? Choose for yourself, create that, and then leave the stuff that is not the best. And I think it it deals with in relationships, with friendships. I I, I do go to church. I'm a very active Christian in my church. And I think about it in church too. There are people at church that I think those behaviors aren't really what I would envision. And, and so I'm not going to harbor on those little things, right? I'm going to take the best and leave the rest. And I think, you know, we've talked about in many episodes about trying to go to treatment centers, for example, if you have the ability to go to ones that allow you to try different modalities, yes. such yes. as like meditation or mindfulness or EMDR, which is eye movement, EMDR, desensitization and reprocessing. Yeah. <laughs> I always have to think about that. Yeah. Go to a place that in a safe environment, if you can, and everyone can't, but if you have the opportunity to try these different things and you, you try something and it doesn't work, then pause and say, okay, I checked that off my list. That's not the path for me. 
I will now try one of the many other options and paths towards success. And each one that works, I'll check it and I'll put it in my toolbox. And then I'll go find another one and check it and put it in my toolbox because I think we can both share that those skills and recovery, I know, have helped me in every area of my life. Right, right. I mean, I'll say a couple things. One is that it's also not that there's this faith-based, non-faith-based um, separation in, in the pathways. There are atheists and agnostics that make 12 steps work. And there are a lot of faith-based and spiritually based people that go into the other programs because they like the self-empowerment aspect better, or they like um, that it's a women's program, or, or they, they like that there's no sponsor or whatever it might be. But you're right. I mean, in, in mental health treatment in general, and substance use disorder is a mental health condition. There is no one way to treat anxiety that works for everybody. There's no one way to treat depression that works for everybody. Right? No. I, I think there's value in us saying, you know, to a newcomer, look, here's what I found helpful for your consideration, right? Here yes. are some ideas and techniques for your consideration. But also, FYI, there's other options. And here's some of them that I know about. Because then, to me, we're putting the person in front of us in the priority position. We're sharing what will be, um, we're, we're putting how to help them succeed above our own ego about, yes. well, this worked for me, so therefore it's going to work for you, which is ridiculous. And I love the idea of telling someone, and I like, if you find a path or you find a tool or, or whatever that I haven't mentioned and it works, let me know. Cause yeah. I want to add that to my list to tell other people. And I can easily say to other people, like, I've not tried this technique, you know, but like, let's just say Wim Hof breathing, Wim Hof breathing, which uh, I'll put a, a link in the show notes for individuals to watch it. It doesn't work for me as, as someone with my level of abuse and, and trauma. It's very suffocating to me. It works for other people to calm their nerves and things like that. And it's a, a breathing technique that uh, I can't describe it. But anyway, so that would be one where I might say to someone, okay, this didn't work for me, or I've never tried this, but I've heard people who have and been successful. So it might be worth trying and then letting me know. Right. Right. And the other thing I will say is that for me, a big part of my recovery plan wasn't just my sobriety, right? It was about my PTSD that I didn't even know I had because I didn't know you could have PTSD and not be a war vet. And for me, it showed up as severe anxiety. And it's very common for people to walk into recovery with um, a substance use disorder and an additional mental health disorder or two. And, and the reality is that it's hard to stay sober if you don't get your other mental health conditions under some semblance of control. And it's for me, I couldn't make any progress on my mental health until I got sober. And I tried, I went to therapy when I was still using and, but the drugs were like a wall between me and everything else. And so I couldn't heal. I couldn't even really explain what had happened or what the import of it was until I got sober. And so that's why I talk in the book about the triumph over trauma and addiction, because they're related as far as how they started, the, the substance use started because of the trauma, but the recoveries are also related. There's an interplay Absolutely. between the, um, the substance recovery and the mental health recovery. When I interviewed Chrissy Clark in that episode 13 on that link between childhood trauma and addiction, she was telling me about, and I don't remember the name of the treatment center, but she was telling me about a treatment center and what their philosophy is, is that when you come in, they don't they don't start off by saying how much do you drink every day or right now. I mean, obviously if they need to stabilize you for a medical purpose, fine. But the, instead they say, let's figure out how much trauma, what, how much trauma and how much you have. And then we'll map out how long your recovery needs to be because we need to, we need to get that underlying trauma part. And you wrote in the book about PTSD. So on page 289, I loved this and highlighted it. Hang on. Because, you know, I have, PTSD from childhood as well. And so now they they refer to it as complex PTSD. So listeners, you'll see it as CPTSD. And it's really individuals who have suffered trauma over extended periods of time. And so you often see it in, in uh, children who've been brutally abused, individuals who are in war camps, you know, concentration camps. It's this extended period of time. And the way that it impacts the brain is different than 
what we consider as the traditional PTSD, which I have for my kidnapping, which is a short-term event. And I can attest, so I'd read this, but I can attest this myself as well. Like the way that I react, my PTSD for my kidnapping is very different from my childhood trauma. But you talked about PTSD and you said, and this is on page 289, you said, and this had a name. So you talked about dissociation and your addiction, which is also very critical. Dissociation is is huge because, you know, um, we try and not live in the moment and we use ways to disassociate from it. And you said, and this had a name, post-traumatic stress disorder. I thought only war vets experienced PTSD. So this diagnosis surprised me, but then made sense as I learned more. With trauma, the body-mind connection can shut down, which carries an enormous price as the same parts of the brain that convey distress also transmit joy. Trauma also can cause unconscious acting out. For example, having accidental, having accidents or exposing yourself to danger and can trigger freezing into helpless immobility when trapped. Plus, trauma can stun the psych such that you don't adjust to updated information unless you make focused efforts to heal. And I think that the thing that's powerful about this is this is an underlying challenge and we kind of you know, cope with it, with these addictions, but dealing with this and healing outside of this is what's so powerful. Yeah. And, and I will say for me, it took me a lot longer to get my PTSD, which showed up as extreme anxiety. It took that healing was a lot longer than getting my substance use under control. I mean, within two and a half years, I really didn't struggle with substances. And I was in therapy, um, whether it was individual or I, I was in a group for women with trauma histories, which was really helpful, but it really was like nine or 10 years. And even then I say I'm mostly recovered from that uh, because it still raises its head once in a while, although at a less severe level. And so in recovery, for example, even in the beginning, even when I was making good choices and moving forward, I wasn't really able to feel proud of it or enjoy it because my anxiety was so extreme that I was always waiting for things to blow up in my face tomorrow. You know, my husband called me the what about tomorrow girl, you know, because I could never. You were, you were convinced you were going to fail out of everything, which I think is this, this um, OCD perfectionist personality. I'm going to make sure everything's lined up perfectly because if not, it's going to completely fail. That's right. That's right. If I make one little mistake, it, I'm going to lose everything. Like, I, and part of it was a lack of trust that, like, that say an employer would be proportionate in their reaction because I didn't grow up with authority figures being proportionate in their reaction, for example, right? Um, but yeah, I, I was always afraid that I was going to lose everything the next day. And that took a long time to get under control. Now I say that, but I don't want to scare the, the viewer because it's incrementally better, right? It's better, 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 better. But it took quite a while for me to really, um, to really feel, it wasn't that I... What I learned was that, yes, bad things will happen. I mean, that's unavoidable in life. But at some point, you have to figure out that you will be able to handle them, right? It doesn't mean you'll handle them without pain or without stress or without, you know, adjustment. But I will be able to handle what life throws at me. And so I don't need to be that hyper vigilant about it or that anxious about it. Plus, my anxiety was actually not helping me make better choices or no. <laughs> anyway so it was really interfering and not producing anything positive no no i i love that and you talk about in the book you said all your recovery work taught you a fundamental concept trauma and neglect probably were the primary drivers of substance use disorder and i think many listeners can relate to this i can but the parents and abusers who broke you were not going to fix you that is key you're not going to be fixed by any of those people. So you said you had to repair yourself. Self-empowerment, which I love. Self-empowerment also means seeking out the assistance you need. Professional help, support groups, recovery buddies, or family. If one avenue fails to yield the desired result, reevaluate it and give it another shot. So can you talk about and tell the listeners how they can learn about the organizations that you're currently working with? 
So I'm on the board for Life Ring Secular Recovery, which is peer support, but we are much more um, focused on self-empowerment and also on the individual nature of the plan. We call it a personal recovery plan because your plan and my plan are probably not going to be the same because we're different people in different places in our lives. And even part of it is that we have different priorities, right? What are we going to work on now? And, um, and that, that can depend on, on what we value the most or what needs the most work. Um, and then I'm also on the board for She Recovers Foundation. And She Recovers isn't just for substance use recovery. It's also mental health recovery, trauma, self-harm, um, behavioral disorders like overeating or technology, you know, excessive technology use, um, grief, uh, workaholism or perfectionism. It's all of those things together because the reality is that most of the women with a substance use disorder have one or more of those other areas. But 20% of She Recovers members don't even have a substance use disorder. They're there for recovery for the other things. But what's nice about it is you don't have to sort of silo your recovery. Like over here, I talk about my drug use and over here, I talk about my eating and over there, I talk about my trauma. You can talk about it all together including the how they interrelate and how they're you know the interplay like like if you're somebody might post on the she recovers Facebook that you know I've been doing really well with alcohol but now um, my food's getting out of control again and so you can talk about how those things how the recoveries um, the, how they, they impact each other when you're trying to recover I, I can relate to that and I that was part of the thing that I've struggled with in recovery is as my doctors will say, I'm like a very good Girl Scout. I went through all the way through Girl Scout, including uh, through my silver award. And I, if one, if I take away one tool, if I take away alcohol, then I have no problem eating when I'm drinking. But if I take away alcohol, then I want to take away food, right? Mm -hmm. And that will be my, the way that I'll get endorphins. And if I eat, then self, I mean, yeah, I can go through all these different ways. So I, I love you sharing that, that individuals, because there are some programs where if your challenge doesn't align with what that core program is, they're like, don't talk about it here. Right, right. And that makes me sad because exactly then you have these individuals that it's not just one thing, right? It's a whole human being. Yeah. And there's, and, the, and there's just so much overlap. And often we hear in spurts as to the different areas, right? I mean, it's not usually linear. You can be doing better in one area. And as you say, that can actually make things worse, at least temporarily in another. And so how do you address them both? And part of, a lot of it's about addressing the underlying pain and, you know, building up your skills. I mean, one of the things that I, I like to talk about with recovery as well is that it's really partly a skills development um, issue, right? That Absolutely. I didn't know how. I didn't even know how to name my feelings. When I was in therapy, my therapist yes. gave me a freaking laminated card with a feelings list on it because she'd say to me, well, how did that make you feel? And I would look I'd be confused. Like, I, I don't know, you know? And so- um, I have one of those. I'm looking to see if it's in my bag. I was reading that and I was like, my sponsor in one of my programs, he's all about feelings. And feelings make me cringe. I mean, I they make me want to throw up talking <laughs> about feelings. In fact, Corey, Corey Lada's, Dr. Corey Lada's episode that was just released on last Saturday, he he was describing talking with some of his clients and, and getting them to say how they feel what they need, how they feel what they need. Well, here I'm interviewing him and I hear in my head, I, I actually take out the need part. Yeah. I replaced in my head need with think. So when I was reciting it back, I was just like, oh, so, you know, what, what you feel, what you think, what you feel, what you think. And he was just like, okay, I've just lost you. I, I've literally just lost you in this therapy session because I don't care. I don't want you to think. I want to know what you need. And I thought, Mary Beth, I thought, well, wait, as a child, I don't, I can't feel and I can't need. No. Those are not luxuries kids that have severe childhood abuse have. They cannot feel, they cannot need. Those will be the end of us, right? We can think, we can strategize, we can figure out how to get our way out of something, but to feel and to just talk about feelings. Oh. And, and so I will say, I am so grateful because listeners, if you don't have an amazing therapist who you can say, 
anything to, or if you don't have an amazing recovery buddy or sponsor or someone in your life that you can sit down and say, okay, this is really hard for me. I, I don't want to say these words and, and work through them. Or, you know, this is really hard for me. I only have 10 days without alcohol and, and you know, send it to, I send it to the bishop of my church because he's helping me, right? Like I, I finally made it to 10 days, double digits, right? This is great. But those types of things are really important because it's teaching me right now. I'm 48. Yeah, I'm still 48. 48. And I'm learning how to say, this is how I feel and this is what I need and reach out and learn those skills. Yeah. And, and I will say that for me, I, I mentioned the women's group of women with trauma histories that I did individual therapy for like three years and meds for a while for my anxiety. And then she put me in this group of women with trauma histories. And the biggest thing that it gave me was that they were connecting their current reactions and their current behaviors back to the trauma in a new yes. way. And so but, but being with people that are maybe a little bit ahead of you in the process um, can really be useful because you can learn from them. And it helped me identify uh, issues or behaviors that needed more work, but I understood better where it came from so I could more effectively start to tackle it. And so there is a lot of benefit with having um, groups, whether it's formal or informal, of people with a similar history that you can actually share honestly your experience, where you are now, what you're working on, what you're thinking about, um, because both of you, all of you will grow from that process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, Mary Beth. So two things. One, is there anything you really wanted to make sure we covered today that we haven't covered? And then at the end, it is a requirement of the podcast that you have to share your favorite motivational quote. So I hope you remembered to bring your favorite motivational ah, quote. I did not, but we'll figure out something. Okay. Um, um, so the, I guess the only thing is just that, you know, part of the reason I wrote, wrote the book was just to try to be, first of all, a stigma producer, right? I mean, yes. I should not meth. And yet, and we haven't really covered this. I actually did become a judge eventually. I went to law school at six and a half years sober. And at 20 years, I was appointed a federal administrative law judge. Um, but um, it's... It's really that, you know, the memory of I used, you know, drugs for 20 years, much of which I shot meth. I was physically and sexually abused as a child and emotionally. And I had multiple sexual assaults and a violent boyfriend. And yet, and I didn't get sober until I was 32, right? It's not like I started young, um, but I was able to really um, gradually and with a lot of work move forward into a happy life not just my job but also as you mentioned my doc who i'm still with after all this we have our 40th anniversary in april by the way oh my so. gosh congratulations <laughs> that's so amazing that is so amazing um but you know the joy of recovery to me is really the the lack of chaos right the lack of that spinning and obsession and you know misery i mean that sucks up all of your brain energy all of your emotional energy and when you can start Moving forward, it just frees you up to figure out who you really are, what you really want, um, and to be able to move forward. And so I just encourage anyone, no matter how stuck you feel or how many unfortunate um, you know, rocks have been put on your back through um, things that weren't your fault, there is, there is a way forward. It's just, it's not going to be a, a light switch. You know, it's going to be a gradual incremental process that takes work. But I really believe, as you say, we can all find our way out. Absolutely. And I, I went back to school to get my engineering degree at 29, a special with as a single mom with a special needs daughter to Georgia Tech. I, everyone else was 18, and so listeners, if if you think it's too late for me, or you think you have some dream and it's impossible because of your past, or you feel as if you have to hide all the secrets in your past because you'll be forever judged of those, find your tribe. It is not too late for here. You have two individuals who didn't really actually get close to even starting their career until their thirties and, and had very varied backgrounds that the world knows about. And guess what? The world still loves us. That's right. I mean, I went to law school at 39. I was not a spring chicken, you know, and life is longer than we think when we're young. <laughs> it, it totally is. Okay. Now, have you had enough time in the back of your head to think about what your motivational quote is? I mean, the only thing I can think of is that my favorite Tom Petty song, which is Refugee, right? You know, yes, you I saw that. 
somewhere, somehow, somebody might have you know p- kidnapped you, taken away, held for ransom. But you don't have to. You don't have to live with the pain of that. And so that for me has always been a, a song that's close to my heart because I felt like I was stuck there and I didn't know a way out. And and I found it. And I'm really, I'm grateful for the people that helped me. And I'm also very proud of myself for doing the, the, um, the hard work and taking control of um, making the good choices for myself. You're absolutely amazing. Such an inspiration. The book is amazing. I encourage everyone from all walks of life to read it. Even if, like I said, if you can't relate to the drugs or alcohol or promiscuity, you can definitely relate to the struggles. And the this is really a story about a woman. You, uh, Mary Beth, you say one woman's triumph over trauma and addiction. I would add to it, it's one woman's ultimate resilience, like desire to fight for the the gifts that she deserves and to continue to fight and do whatever it takes, as long as it takes, and continue to get up again after every single time when failure happened and to say, you know what, that was, that was yesterday. Okay. We're going to try again, which is so powerful. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And it's such a vulnerable book. It is amazing. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I've enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us today with your coffee and conversation. We hope you've been encouraged and learned something from today's story. To learn more about today's guest, please check out our show notes for more details. Now it's time to remember to like this episode, subscribe, and turn on your notifications to ensure you do not miss future episodes. Recovery Advocate Network envisions a world where individuals with mental health challenges receive comprehensive and effective treatment without the worry of financial burdens to themselves or their families all without the stigmas often present in society. We are proud that every individual work with RAN does so on a 100% volunteer basis. You can support the mission by making a financial donation via PayPal or Venmo, or email donate at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org if you would like to donate items for our next fundraising auction. Please visit our website at www.recoveryadvocatenetwork.org to learn more. Now, stay in the loop about upcoming events, future episodes, and more by following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter X, TikTok, LinkedIn, and all major podcast platforms. As a reminder, the experiences and advice expressed in this episode are the hosts and guests' own personal stories and do not represent the opinions of any organization mentioned. RAN is passionate about opening the doors for all voices and experiences not just those expressed in any particular podcast. If you want to share your experiences or expertise, we encourage you to be a future guest by emailing us at podcast at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org or submit a blog by emailing blog at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org. We also encourage you to comment on the episode so that we can continue to provide content that is most beneficial to the community. How do you do that? Visit our website at www.recoveryadvocatenetwork.org And in the top right corner, click that comment button and comment. So listeners, what do you need to do? Pause what you're doing, subscribe, follow us. Please give us a like and a five-star rating, write some meaningful comments, and most importantly, share these episodes with your friends. You never know whose heart you will touch, so please be a part of a reason someone has new hope today. If this episode was triggering to you, we encourage you to contact your support system, therapist, national and community support groups, the Global Crisis Text Line by texting 741-741 and or if in the U.S. dialing 988 to reach the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. If you're in the U.S. and need additional resources such as shelter, support group resources, transportation, food, and or a safe confidential path out of physical or emotional domestic abuse, please call 211 or visit www.211info.org for assistance. Now, we know you are very busy and we are grateful that you said yes to sharing time with us today. If you stuck to our three C's of engagement and listened to the full episode, then visit the podcast section of our website 
and leave the comment about the podcast and you'll be entered to win an autographed copy of one of the books from one of our book club series, as well as a coffee and conversation coffee mug. So thanks again. Until next time, back to your coffee.